So I've been thinking a lot about model rockets recently, and I have a problem. Er, wait, that's not quite what I meant. So here's the thing. Passive stability is so 1940s. It's 2023. I should be able to put the bare minimum amount of thought into hardware design and just have all of my stability issues fix themselves in software. Now, the problem that I have is the model rocket motors that hobbyists like me work with are small and can't lift much weight. And if you start to scale things up to be bigger uh, using kind of the more extreme hobby level stuff, it gets really scary really quickly. This in and of itself is not a big deal, but if I do want active control, servos, kind of heavy to mount one of these things if I want to get any kind of altitude. So I figure, let's get clever and engineer our way out of this. Okay, and with that slightly contrived segue out of the way, let's break out the night null. But wait, what is night null? Good question. Short answer, sci-fi magic. Long answer, science fiction magic. Okay, okay, so what it actually is, is a nickel titanium alloy developed at the Naval Ordnance Lab. Uh, and the name that you've probably heard before is Shape Memory Alloy. I'm not gonna get into the specifics of the austenite, martensite, you know, crystal structure stuff of how this stuff really works. Um, there's better mediums for that than listening to me talk. Uh, let's just chalk that up to one of life's great mysteries, you know, like where the sun goes at night or why my friends don't message me back. All we need to know is because of the crystal structures formed in the metal, it can do a bunch of really interesting stuff, ranging from some wild suitable elastic behavior to reforming into a set shape after being deformed. The thing that we care about with this particular flavor of night null wire is when we heat it past a transition temperature of 90 degrees, it'll pull with a pretty significant amount of force. For some context, this muscle wire that I have here is 200 micrometers in diameter, but can pull with over half of a kilogram of force when heated. Okay, so this is all cool in theory, but I've already talked for too long, and I suspect my viewer retention has suffered. So firstly, thank you folks for sticking around this long. Secondly, let's get a physical design thrown together so we can run some real deal tests. Alright, and this is the simple design I came up with for us to test on. So we have this kind of crane-like assembly. We'll have our load connected to the front here. We'll have the whole thing running on a set of skateboard bearings, so we don't need to worry about friction interfering with our results. And then this back section here is where we'll run the night null wire from a bolt that passes through these holes. Uh, all the way down to the base here. And this should work as a pretty good test bed to kind of get the mechanics of this night null wire down. All right, so we got our CAD model done and I think it's time for us to just go full computer aid manufacturing on this thing and just get it done as quick as possible so we can move on to the real testing. Um, and so I'm gonna hop over into the manufacturing workspace here and just have the computer handle all the manufacturing for me. All right, there we go. So let's just go and Get this thing done. Our computer's amazing. Our test stand's good to go, so now what we need is a source of heat that we can use to heat the wire, and we can see the crane moves up. Now, what you'll notice is it's not returning back to its original state, and that's because this wire, once you heat it up and it contracts, you need to apply a restoring force in order to return the wire to its original length. What we're going to do to simplify testing is add these springs connected on the load portion of this crane assembly in order to return this to its length after the wire is no longer heated. Okay, so for obvious reasons, using a lighter to heat this wire up is not the best method of applying heat. So we're going to be clever and we're going to use the wire itself to heat itself up. And by that I mean we're going to use it as a heating element by passing electric current through the wire in order to actuate it. To do that though, we're going to need some driving circuitry, so let's go check that out. So, for the night null data sheet, it looks like we can safely put about 0.6 amps worth of current through the wire without it suffering any overheating or ill effects. And so, because I want the driver circuit that we're going to make to be as wire length agnostic as possible, uh, it's going to mean that we're going to need to make it into a constant current source. And for that, I'm going to use an LM317. For those of you who aren't familiar, the LM317 is an adjustable voltage regulator, and what it seeks to do is ensure that the output and adjustment pin has a voltage differential of 1.25 volts. So by wiring it up like this, regardless of the load that we apply, we're gonna get a constant current flowing through the LM317 uh, and thus through our circuit. In our case, because we want 0.6 amps running through the wire, uh, we do a little calculation here to figure out the resistor required. So that's the 1.25 volts drop over the current that we want. And that gives us a resistance of 2.08 ohms, uh, which I'm just gonna round to two ohms because that's the resistor that I have. Now, just to make sure that we're not making any mistakes, I'm going to throw this into a circuit simulator and we can take a closer look at the voltage and the current moving through each part of the system. 
Okay, so here's a simulated circuit. Uh, so I went ahead and measured the resistance of our load on the test stand there, and so we see it's about 4.1 ohms of resistance. Um, so that's in our simulation here. Uh, and the main thing that I want to look at in this simulation is the power dissipation of this resistor. So if you see, it's, well, we'll round it to a watt, but uh, it's, it's 835 milliwatts of power dissipation required. And that's pretty extreme. That's a lot more than the, uh, the quarter watt of the resistors that I'm used to dealing with. So we're going to need to get something large. <laughs> These are your standard run-of-the-mill resistors that I typically use on any of these hobbyist projects. This is the resistor that we need in order to dissipate all that power. There is something absolutely ridiculous to me about this. I, I find it so funny that it's just a scaled up version uh, of this. It feels like, I don't know, baby's first resistor. <laughs> uh, anyway, if, if any electrical engineers out there have a suggestion to make this better, um, you know, so we don't need to use these giant power components, I definitely post it in the comments and I'll pin it so anyone who wants to make this in the future can use that uh, and kind of benefit from uh, all of our knowledge here. Anyway, despite the slightly goofy looks, this should work, so let's wire this up and get a real test done. I have an ammeter connected up in series with the wire, so we'll be able to see if the current that we calculated is actually being supplied. And I went ahead and added a MOSFET controlled by an Arduino, uh, programmed to cycle on and off in five second intervals to represent a slightly more realistic setup for this thing. And I think the only thing we have left to do is plug it in and I'll see if we've made any mistakes. Okay, the current seems a bit low. Let's give it a second to warm up. Okay, it's been a bit and I've let it cycle a few times and the current does seem to be climbing, but I think I'm gonna replace the reference resistor with a lower resistance value to see if we can get more current out of this thing. So I swapped out that two ohm resistor that we calculated with a 1.6 ohm resistor. So let's see if that boosts the current up and gets this thing moving just a little bit faster. Okay, and that is the actuation speed that we're looking for. So I upped the voltage of the supply to nine volts and we seem to be in the clear. I joked about it before, but it legitimately feels like magic watching this thing move. I don't know if it comes across on camera, but it just is completely silent while actuating, which is way weirder of a thing to witness than I was expecting. This is already pretty awesome, but while I was doing research for this project, I stumbled across this paper, which details a method of closed loop control based on the changing resistance of nitinol wire as it extends and contracts. And I want to try it out. Right, so for those who aren't familiar with control theory, let's quickly break down closed and open loop control. And I think the best way to do that is with an example we're all familiar with. A toaster. So if we want to make toast with a toaster, we put bread in, and adjust the timer dial, and the bread pops out as toast with some level of toastedness. Uh, this is an open loop system because the toaster has no idea what the bread toasted state is. You know, it could be charcoal, and as long as the timer isn't up, the toaster is going to keep going. Now, if we were to add a way to monitor the bread with a camera or temperature probe, or in this simplified case, if we just look at the bread as it's toasting and have the toaster stop when the bread is toasted to perfection, that would be a closed loop system because the output of the process is used to adjust the process itself on a continuous basis. Now, what this means for us boils down to us being able to vary the heating of the wire based on the position we want it to be in. Uh, one way to do that would be to use a potentiometer to get a direct positional measurement, and this would be a little bit bulky, but would work. Um, and that brings us, full circle, back to the paper. Because the resistance of the wire changes with respect to its length, we can set up a circuit that measures the resistance of the wire and then uses some code to take this resistance and either add more or less power to make it contract or extend to get us to the desired length. This is going to take a bit of messing around with to get right, so I'll be back when I have a potential design ready to test. Right, well, to be honest, I was hoping this would go a lot more smoothly than it did, uh, but unfortunately I'm having some difficulties getting the theory to line up with the practice. Uh, I did a bunch of testing, removed the constant current supply because it was being inconsistent, and then tested out a few designs and really didn't have much luck. So I think it's time to try a different solution. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to take a resistance measurement at its minimum length and then one at its maximum length. And because the slope is close to linear, we'll interpolate based off of that, and I think we should get pretty close to the idealized results. Hey, someone should edit that here. Uh, upon reflection, the words I just said were complete nonsense, so let me try that again. We're going to take a resistance measurement as the wire contracts by measuring the voltage across an in-series resistor every 10 milliseconds. While doing this, we're also going to take a displacement measurement at the max extension and max contraction of the wire. 
Because the expected resistance displacement curves are linear-ish, we're then going to plot and linearize the data to develop a resistance to extension formula that we can use to drive a PID controller. Okay, now back to the current timeline. And here's our final test setup. So I took the equation that we found and used it to build a PID controller in the Arduino. So the controller is going to take whatever set point we give it and turn that into a PWM value to use with the MOSFET uh, over here in the circuit. That power is then going to get sent through the wire and we'll collect our voltage measurement across that resistor there. I also went ahead and wired an oscilloscope probe to the output of the MOSFET and so that way we can see what the PWM signal is doing in real time. Now, the last thing to do is take a measurement of where this weight is um, versus, well, where we're going to find it after we run our PID controller. And so it's looking like, if we use the oscilloscope here as a reference plane, uh, the bottom of the weight looks to be about 55 millimeters off of the base here. So we'll use that as our reference and we'll go ahead and use a set point in our uh, controller there and we'll see if we can get it to 65 millimeters. So it should be going to a set point of 10 millimeters, and it most definitely is not, so something is wrong. I'm gonna go take a look at that and see what I can figure out. Okay, so that took a bit of time, but I think I found the problem. Uh, not a surprise to anyone, the breadboarded together driver circuitry that I made um, is super delicate, and I think I must have bumped the wires, and it completely threw off the, the voltage measurement across that resistor. Um, so it was just totally confusing our PID controller. I think I have it all fixed, so let's give this another test. Okay, she seems to be holding steady right there, so I'm gonna go in and take a quick measurement. Okay, it's hovering around 68 millimeters, and you know what? That's close enough to 65 for this to count. Okay, and with our set point at 15, we're looking at about 73 millimeters, maybe 74. You know what, I'm gonna call that good. So, for those of you who paid attention to that B-roll that I just placed in there, probably noticed that the measurements weren't quite consistent, and I think that's actually just a limitation of the setup that we have going on here. Uh, there's a lot of things that are gonna to need to be improved before I bring this into a real application. First and foremost, gonna to need to replace that breadboard with an actual perf board, or even better, a PCB setup. The inconsistencies in the breadboard connectivity and, and connections really introduces a lot of variance in the reference voltage uh, that we just can't afford if we're going to make this thing any more precise. Next, I think it would be a really good idea to replace the Arduino with possibly a different kind of microcontroller. I'm not sure, maybe a, a Teensy or a Pi Pico. I'm not familiar with the ADC they use, but the one in the Arduino here is super noisy and it's probably not doing us any good. And on that note, I should probably get an actual voltage reference chip, uh, because right now I'm just using the internal chip uh, on the Arduino, the 1.1 volt reference, and that has, I think, what, 20% uncertainty applied to it, and that's also, again, not doing us any favors. So there's a bunch of things I need to improve. Um, if I forgot anything in that list, definitely post in the comments, and I will add that to the list of things that I need to fix with this. And as you probably gathered from that, that means that this video is over. I think we've gone on long enough, and we've proven that conceptually, this should work. We should be able to get this. We just need to fine tune some of the details and we'll be able to turn this into something way more useful. I already have some really cool ideas in mind. Anyway, folks, that about wraps things up from here. Um, thank you as always for watching. Uh, something kind of exciting is while I was recording this, we actually hit a thousand subscribers. Um, I really never thought that that many people would care about any of the things that I have to do. Uh, and I really never thought that I'd make it this far. So uh, truly thank you folks for watching. And with all that said, I'll see you next time.